So please move around as quietly as you can. Harry, let me start with you because I've, I've mentioned you a couple of times about the inevitability or the, or the lack of inevitability about TR's presidency. What do you, what do you say to all of that? Um, I, I think I have two different takes on this. Um, the, on the first, uh, which is where you had started, that is, had McKinley not been assassinated, would Vice President uh, Theodore Roosevelt have managed to gain, at some later point, the Republican nomination? And I think that's um, not unlikely, but would have been difficult, precisely because of his difficulties with the mainline leaders of the party. Uh, the, uh, after all, he was put into the vice presidency with the uh, work of, of major party leaders who wanted to get him out of the New York governorship because he had opposed the interests of the Republican Party organization, particularly regarding patronage, so that he would have had a struggle. Uh, no, but I, there's another take I have on this, and that is, it seems to me, uh, think about this, does it make sense to take the handful of, of people who've been American presidents and to go through them and ask the question, were they seen early as wunderkind? In other words, were they predicted to be presidents? Perhaps the turning this around makes more sense to say, to ask rather, if we could think of a large pool of people who are at their mid, early mid-age, perhaps or even young adulthood, thought of as presidential level politicians, which is hundreds and hundreds of Americans. That knows the pool of possibilities. This ranges across those who are world scholars, those who are of the, the, the young comers in the military ranks, the, the, the young colonels who made it quickly. Um, I think we find lots of people like this. In other words, people of great talent, energy, whose, um, whose cohort look at them and say, wow, this is going to be somebody. It's a star. Maybe president. I don't think that's that great. That's not that rare. Yeah. And um, I can think of some examples of this. Uh, a while back, this is a long time ago, although we're old enough, maybe all of us to remember this, many, so many of us, Esquire magazine, um, years ago, it was during the early 70s, mid-70s, uh, had an issue with a long essay and asked the question, why are our presidents such dull, unpromising people, generally? And then it went on with this long list of really great Americans alive then who served the presidency. The person they had put on the cover was the CEO of Cummings Diesel, who was also president of the National Council of Churches. He was a major philanthropist. He had made of his hometown, Columbus, Indiana, a kind of museum of great modern architecture. He was a hell of a guy. And Esquire was asking, why wasn't he getting the presidential the answer is simple. It's not the way American politics works. We load the dice towards the doll often. <laughs> so, anyway, so that's uh, what I'm suggesting is flip it over. Look not at the end of the funnel, but at the end of the funnel. And we see lots of, I think, interesting people, a bit like TR as young men. So let's, I mean, I, I want to moderate this as little as possible. So jump in and talk to each other, and we'll take questions here. Well, I think that. Um, the very concept of inevitability flattens history in a way that, you know, I mean, historians like the, the messiness of it. They like it that it's so many causes. 
years, you're talking about his administrative mastery. He's the U.S. Civil Service Commissioner under two administrations of two parties. Right. Now that's interesting that he managed to hold on yeah. hold across a, a party election. Then he's the uh, New York Police Commissioner. He's had a lot of administrative activity before he becomes president. If, if you were Roosevelt and you wanted to be the president of the United States, as Bill Clinton did from the age of 16 on, he says, that doesn't sound like a very promising path. No, that's, and that's, that's a very interesting point, I think, as we're talking about a, a career track that leads to the presidency. Um, what, what I saw as distinctive as I researched my book uh, trying, trying to figure out what characterized Roosevelt's presidency as a, as a style of leadership. Um, it, it struck me as, as really unusual that this talented, energetic man was following an administrative path at a time that the American administrative state, that is the, the executive branch, um, was of minimal importance. It, it was, it, it, so if you could look back at his career, we could suggest that he was, for whatever reason, placed into precisely the right points of the administrative state, which was just beginning to emerge, that were going that would give him an experience and a leverage on the issues that would be high on the agenda after 1900. And so, um, instead of being uh, the patronage boss of the post office which would be a pretty nice plum for the later 19th century, he was put into the agency that most politicians thought was either the devil's lair or a joke, the civil service commission. You mean get rid of spoils? Spoils, patronage, was the mother's milk of American politics. It's what the parties lived on. So this would seem utterly unimportant. And so, so to, to, then, to tie some of this stuff up we're talking about, you do have to wonder if we, if we do want to think of the Roosevelt career as inevitable in some way. It wouldn't look circa 1880s, early 1890s, that he was making the right decisions about his career path. Because it, it, it was in the, in the short run, in the immediate context, those positions don't look like they have leverage over important influence in party politics, and you need that influence to get a nomination. And as U.S. Civil Service Commissioner, he didn't follow a politically savvy oh, path. No. He, was, he was dangerously impulsive. Uh, well, or committed to civil, civil to, to the merit system. And he, he, he um, openly uh, uh, clashed with members of the cabinet uh, who were committed to using patronage in their, um, in their uh, agencies, particularly the, the Postmaster General. Um, and um, on any, any clash with senators. I mean, that seems like a recipe for disaster. So, but it worked. And so, by serendipity, he gained the experience that then became so potent for him um, after 1900. Excellent, thank you. Questions for any or all? Yes. Question for Professor Jacobson. Can you say anything about Rudyard Kipling's prediction that he would be president? Well, there, there was a Kipling, I mean, there would, there's a long list of other people's responses to uh, TR, and some of them were negative, some of them were positive. Um, I, I won't. I, uh, Kipling was one of those who said that he was he was in Roosevelt's presence, and he found himself spinning around in the orbit of Theodore Roosevelt, and he thought of him as the coming man. And Roosevelt admired Kipling too. Kipling was a little miffed that Roosevelt was the center of attention, and he, Kipling, wasn't when they were together. But this, was, this was a very common experience of, of many people who knew Roosevelt. But Benjamin Harrison, who, um, who placed Roosevelt in the U.S. Civil Service Commission and, and was really skeptical. I mean, there's, a, there's always skepticism at, at every point in Roosevelt's career. McKinley was skeptical about making him the vice president. Um, so was Mark Hanna. McKinley was skeptical about making Roosevelt the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and he accurately predicted that Roosevelt would be too pugnacious. Um, but Harrison said of Roosevelt, the problem with this guy is he wants to reform all the evils of the world between breakfast and 5 p.m. And there was that quality in Roosevelt that, he, that people that were, I mean, McKinley is a, is a, is a solid, stolid, centrist, an establishment figure as you could imagine. All these people 
look on Roosevelt and, and, and they get that he's talented and they get that he has extraordinary energy and that he is righteous and kind of amazing and charismatic, but they find something disquieting in him, but against their better wishes, they wind up putting him in positions where he does exactly the thing they most feared that he, that he would do. But Kipling was, was impressed by Roosevelt indeed. Other questions? Yes. Uh, I was thinking about taking all these administrative jobs. Didn't PR need a job? <laughs> same time that Theodore Roosevelt Sr. was suffering from cancer and was undiagnosed 
but he died about eight weeks after the nomination failed. And there's, there's some evidence that TR sort of associated this violent reaction and these attacks in the press with his father's death. And uh, he wrote in a letter to his uh, mother, I think, or his brother Elliot maybe, after his father's death about how he wanted to do something to honor his name. And uh, this is the time that he stopped being called TD or, or the, and he asked his uh, sisters to call him Theodore. I really think, you know, the first forays into New York politics to go into the state legislature, it's interesting that a lot of the people that he's trying to bring reform against or that he's trying to get exposed and arrested and put to jail are sort of part of that little group that was attacking his father. And uh, T.R. Sr.'s last letter to his son um, said something to the effect of, I despair of the state of government and I don't know how the country can survive with so much corruption. Um, and I really think that going into the civil service and rooting out corruption and, and putting in a merit system was probably very much a, a monument to his father. I think, you know, it's easy for us to talk about someone being, thinking about the presidency. And, and I think that certainly at the beginning of his career, he wasn't thinking of himself and his future so much as, as maybe of completing his father's work. I just want to ask all of you to speak pretty directly into the microphones. Apparently, they're killing a yak or something in the kitchen. And so, Sorry. Um, so, so make sure everyone can hear. If you can't hear, just cup your ear, and I'll make sure that they um, uh, speak up a little a lot more loudly. David, you've been making some notes. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm learning a lot about New York and its presidents. Well, maybe let me ask you a follow-up question. Since, since you're on that topic, I mean, to reflect on last year's theme was family, and, 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 and we heard fair amount about that from you, but T.R. and his father, on the first day in the White House, he's signing bills and he realizes that it's his father's birthday and he says it seems so moving and appropriate and I wish my father had lived to see this and his father didn't serve in the Civil War, when Roosevelt did serve in Cuba, he said, now I've vindicated the family, I think I've given my children something to be proud of. Can you just talk a little bit about, you know, we think of his ambition as sort of free-floating, but a lot of it, as you say, was to please the memory of his father. Theodore Roosevelt said that his father was the best man he ever knew, and um, I think throughout his life he, he admired him as a child. You know, they used to compete for who got to sit next to father. You know, uh, every morning Theodore Roosevelt Sr. would sit down with his four children, and they'd have a little catechism or a Sunday school class where they'd, they'd read something together, and the children would would fight <laughs> who's going to get to sit next to dad. Um, I think David McCullough in his book uh, speculates that some of Theodore Roosevelt's asthma attacks as a child, um, they seemed to increase once he sort of realized that he could get his father's undivided attention, that maybe he would go for a ride in the carriage with Dad alone. And, and so, you know, McCullough speculates that there was, there was some, uh, not planned, but, but an interesting coincidence there. Um, I, I, the whole thing about Theodore Roosevelt and the Civil War, I don't ever think that Theodore Roosevelt was, was embarrassed or ashamed that his father didn't serve in the war. I really don't. I, I think that his father um, was in a hard position with his wife being from Georgia and her two brothers being in the, in the Confederate Navy um, and her being terrified that somehow they would meet in the, in the field of battle and, and kill each other. He was very active in the Civil War. He was a member of the Union League Club, which raised money for two New York regiments um, you know, to equip them in seven month battle, including a black regiment. And he went to Washington and worked uh, on various projects during the war. He came up with the idea for the allotment system, which was basically nowadays soldiers' uh, pay can be automatically sent home to their families, and they get a portion where they are. But during the Civil War, you know, when, when men went off to battle, their salaries went with them. And they were paid in camp. They weren't as paid uh, back at, at home. And so their families um, could, could run into a lot of hard times economically. And T.R. Sr. came up with this idea of, of letting soldiers sign allotments to send part of their salary home directly. And uh, traveled, he was one of three New York State commissioners traveled to the different um, 
military encampments to get the soldiers to sign up for that. And then he, he worked on helping to convert the uh, military medical system, uh, which was not up to par yet, into a, an effective system uh, to meet the soldiers' needs. He worked with Dorothy Dix, and uh, he worked with Claire Barton at the Red Cross. So it's not like T.R. Sr. was sitting at home uh, eating bonbons and uh, polishing his nails or something for another. <coughs> so uh, there's never any evidence that, that T.R. Was, was embarrassed by that. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, sir? We've talked about the gray character of the President's before Roosevelt. What about the shadow of Roosevelt himself and his successors? They seem to be fairly gray locked until a quarter century later when a man with the same name, uh, suspiciously similar curriculum, vacated, and a great force of personality can somehow escape the shadow. Is there a shadow? Did Roosevelt cast a shadow on the presidents that followed? What kind of a legacy shadow did TR cast on the presidents who followed? I think that um, I want to answer that question by addressing something um, a little bit different, which is I think one thing that, that's come up a bit in our discussions but might be touched on more fully is that a lot of Roosevelt's greatness comes from the progressive movement. And the progressive movement itself was a fascinating but really messy and complicated movement. Uh, one historian said it was the first social movement that was experienced by every American. Um, but, but one of the complicated things about progressivism was that it was really, it had really two different impulses. One was social justice, the Jacob Rees kind of thing, and the other was social control. Uh, prohibitionism, getting rid of alcohol, getting uh, disenfranchising African Americans or immigrants because they seem impure elements in the body politic. And I think that uh, part of Roosevelt's brilliance was that he could play both sides of that progressivism in a way that no future president uh, really could. Um, he could I read one document by him when I was working on my first book where he said uh, clearly his strategy was to play back and forth from reformer to conservative. He said something like, I, I cannot wait. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bewilder the conservatives by looking like a reformer and then I'm going to turn around and I'm going to bewilder the reformers by acting like a conservative. And that's how I'm going to get my way in the end. Um, and even in the, in the Panama Canal, uh, I mentioned briefly that he, he tried to bring progressivism to the canal zone, to the construction project. And one of the ways he did that was by bringing a reformer who represented the National Civic Federation, which was a progressive, kind of middle of the road progressive organization. He brought a, a woman who worked for that organization to the canal zone to investigate uh, and suggest reforms. And she did a very thorough job. She interviewed everybody. She, she investigated thoroughly for several weeks and then wrote a lengthy report calling upon the government to make a zillion changes. And the, the people in charge of the construction project were completely aghast and thought, who is this woman coming here and telling us what to do? Roosevelt himself thought that her, her suggestions were all fine, except one. She said that there were common complaints that there was graft and corruption going on in the construction project. And he, Roosevelt immediately wrote her and ordered that she take that out of the report before it would be released publicly. And he said, he made a, I thought, a really revealing comment. He said, to say that there is graft or corruption, it's rather like saying that someone's wife is a flirt and an adulteress. Uh, it may not be true, she may not be, but once the charge has been made, the damage is done. And so on those grounds, he, he ordered to take it out. So I think that he was, he was extremely strategic, extremely uh, skilled at playing both sides of the progressive movement. And 
I wouldn't say, I, I think that Woodrow Wilson uh, was not in a Rooseveltian shadow. I think he was, he had very much his own vision um, and, and he, he's an annoying figure in some ways, Wilson is, uh, but you know, what president isn't? Um, but I don't see him as in Roosevelt's shadow. However, I do think that he never learned to play both sides in the skillful way that Roosevelt did. But you say, let me ask you just to follow that up a little bit, or anyone else who wants to. You say he wasn't in Roosevelt's shadow, and clearly he was his own man, but he was a very smart man and a historian, and he saw that Taft had miscarried. I mean, Wilson must have thought a lot about how do you follow Roosevelt and Taft, and what, what, how do you position yourself to succeed as president? Yeah, I think he did. Um, you know, I think that it, to me, it comes back to the, um, the maverick character of Roosevelt. I think that Wilson was sometimes too thoughtful, um, sometimes too much wrapped up in his own uh, mindset and not as much of an energetic actor as, as Roosevelt was. And that, that limited Wilson's impact, I think, sometimes. And David, I don't know if you're comfortable with this question. Just tell me if you're not. Um, but you know, you've spent a lot of time talking about TR and race, and, and, and I think you've shown us that it's a very complex and in some ways problematic issue, but Wilson had a very problematic uh, presidency with respect to race too. Right, and I guess the interesting thing about Wilson is that a number of people, Du Bois and other African Americans, supported him in the 1912 election, and were very disappointed because Wilson's emphasis really became, or Wilson's legacy became, the segregation of most administrative offices in the executive branch of the White House. And in addition to that, obviously, he became a symbol for racism, being both a Southerner and also um, enjoying Birth of a Nation, and you know, saying that it was um, like um, history written like the lightning. And um, I think what's striking is that as far as race relations are concerned, Theodore Roosevelt remained popular remain popular among the masses of African Americans. Um, a majority of them probably supported him in the 1912 election, and he was lucky, or and the nation was unlucky, that he was surrounded by people who weren't active on race at all, and who weren't really interested, obviously, in ensuring justice for any African Americans. But for those who don't know or have forgotten, say a little bit more about Birth of a Nation. It was a film. Oh, yeah. Well, Birth of a Nation was obviously the film that was based on Thomas Dixon's novels and, you know, where it really emphasizes the role that Reconstruction played in um, threatening white Southerners and, it's, and it emphasized the corruptness of African American legislatures that were elected in South Carolina and Mississippi. And at the center of that is that if you give African American political powers, they're going to end up menacing white women and raping white women. And there's a famous scene where a woman jumps from the top of a mountain rather than allowing um, a union, a, a black former Union soldier to uh, rape her. So it was in many ways bandied the worst discriminations against African Americans. And President Wilson so far from distancing himself from that praised it. Precisely. You were sure in the White House, I think, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, and it really portrays the Ku Klux Klan as the creators of American national identity. Um, it, it, I taught the film once, and I used to teach a class on American history and film, and I, I, it's a really brilliant film, but it's, it's a scary film because it's so brilliant that you, you find yourself at a certain moment kind of rooting for the Ku Klux Klan. And I, I was teaching it, and I was asking my students how they felt about it, and one student said, well, when I watch a film, I just try to shut off my brain and not think about anything and watch it. And I was like, you have said exactly what I hope this class will get you to rethink, you know. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, here. 
Springs Forest all on the roads. Does anyone want to touch that? Sorry, I don't know. Well, that's for the future. We'll look at it another time. Other questions? This is your chance. Yes. Establishing a public profile that he could use essentially against the political inside, so that um, I'm thinking of the governorship now. So that when Roosevelt broke with being very careful to not break fully with uh, Thomas Platt, the boss of the of the state Republican machine, um, Roosevelt and and with the, the issues of conflict were over state policy regarding um, the issuance of franchises, that is, essentially monopolies, such as transportation um, and power. Um, Roosevelt wanted to clean that up and charge much more money for those franchise rights and make them shorter live. Um, this was a major source of money for the Republican Party, however, payments from, payoff from these companies. And um, what Roosevelt at that point went public with his appeals to great effect. And so I think what Roosevelt was able to do was to find, him, find an equilibrium between the party and his public image that made him difficult to ignore by the party um, rather than being totally an outsider. In other words, there's a kind of um, strategic genius about his behavior because it was, this was also a time when there was no political mechanism for someone who was totally an outsider to gain access to the power he had. Um, think again about, again, this relates to the governorship. Um, it's very difficult to think of Roosevelt gaining the nomination for the governorship if he hadn't arrived back uh, at Montauk at the end of Long Island with his Rough Riders and then self-dramatized himself as the hero with his uniform. And at the same time, the party was in deep trouble. The last Republican governor, the existing Republican governor, was deeply in trouble over corruption, the Erie Canal stuff. And um, the party was going to go down to defeat. And here was the hero at the end of Long Island, um, posing himself as, the, as the, the best nominee, and then drawing a business group, speaking of outsider, drawing a business group in New York City to want to form an organization to nominate him as an independent, which Roosevelt, of course, immediately realized, boy, that's too far outside, but it, but it forced the issue. Republicans gave him the nomination, first ballot. And so, in other words, he was a genius at using an outsider status, but keeping the door unlocked, not too far outside. Perry, let me ask you a, a follow-up question about that comes out of what you're saying. You've used a very strong term, strategic genius. And in your talk the other night, and in your book, you talked about the sort of the matrix, the world that Roosevelt was trying to make move. He was like an Archimedean lever, trying to move it in a certain direction. As you reflect back on his seven years and 171 days as president, did he, do you believe he made the most of the possibilities of, of the government of the United States in his time, or could he have had a different strategy that might have made more of that period? Any president could, in, in, in our dreams, do more, so it's possible. But one of the, I think a, a comparison that's useful here is to compare um, just the first, Wilson's first term in Roosevelt's 
um, McKinley term, the unelected term. Um, Wilson was an extraordinarily productive legislative leader. Uh, probably the most, well, um, this is the president who achieved more legislatively than any of his predecessors. Uh, he was able to perform as, a, as if he were a prime minister. Roosevelt, Roosevelt had nothing like that accomplishment legislatively in his first term, or in his presidency. Uh, now, what, what, what Wilson was able to be a prime minister because he had a strong majority in his first term. And it was a, and it was a majority of Democrats who weren't quite sure how to be a majority in both houses. That is, they hadn't held that kind of power, characteristically. And so he was, they, they weren't divided. Now, none of that's true of Roosevelt. Roosevelt had this very divided Republican Party with a minority of progressives, a majority of stand patters, and the only way Roosevelt perhaps could have achieved much more to get a Wilson-like possibility in terms of passing legislation would have been to do something that would have been un unheard of for him. It would have been to try to put together a, a, a cross-party reform-oriented coalition. And neither that does not fit Theodore Roosevelt's view of partisanship, but it also doesn't fit the style of party politics of the period. So in short, I don't think he in practice could have gotten much more out of the legislature. Yes? I have a question just about the conservation ethic. Obviously, PR deserves his place as a grandfather setting aside public land and so forth and, and the great work he's done there, but in some respects, and maybe I should ask Gary this yesterday, he could have been so much more if he had aligned himself closer with John Muir views than a different picture of one. I just wonder why, if, for example, putting Forest Service in agriculture instead of keeping it in the interior, uh, you know, that's a real symbolic and Conservation, could he have gotten more had he been more of a purist, more of a murite? I, I, boy, I don't, I don't see how TR is limited conservation wise. I, I, I think that in the time period that he's living, you know, that, that the frontier may have been closed, as Frederick Jackson Turner said, but there was so much pressure in the West especially, you know, that now that people are here, we have to make it livable, we have to make it usable. And and when you look at TR's writings on, on natural resources, you know, he did see them as having a utilitarian function, at, you know, needing the natural resources to help build the country, build the communities in the West. Um, you know, one of the things that, we talk about the Forest Service, we talk about, you know, the, the bird refuges and something, but, but TR had, uh, really expanded the uh, building dams and the water projects. You know, that it's water management that's the big issue in the West and how to get water to these communities. And, and so, you know, there, there are dam projects all over uh, the West under TR. I, th I think, you know, again, we might be, be looking at this with, you know, a hundred years of perspective on it. That when TR was looking at the West, there, there's so much of it. It's so undeveloped that their natural resources seem endless. And uh, it's interesting. I, there's a there's a quote I think for after his African safari, where he talks about looking at uh, across the belt and seeing herds of wildebeest and how they're just endless. That it seemed that there was an endless herd of wildebeest. But then he sort of makes a connection between, and this is what, what it must have been like when there were buffalo on the plain. And he understands the concept of losing species, but I'm not sure that, you know, maybe in his mind, losing open space was going the same way. You know, that, that so much of, of what he supported was practical. You know, the whole uh, debate over Hetch Hetchy Dam in California. 
and uh, how Muir fought so much to try to preserve that valley and you know, San Francisco City Council and water commissioners in California were just like, we have to bring water to this city and this is the only way we can do it. So I, I think there was always a, a real practical, how do we make a community work aspect to Roosevelt's point of view. Can I just make a quick run at that? I, I guess I disagree with the premise because I think that going back to Perry's term of strategic mastery and genius, this was Roosevelt squeezed as much conservation out of this country in Congress and the executive branch as could possibly be squeezed and more. I mean, he, he was extraordinarily successful and, and, he, and he was brilliantly well prepared for this because if you know the history of the national parks, one of the ways that this worked was that it was easier to build a national park where there was no perceived economic value. If it was a place that that didn't have mining value or any any mining value at that moment, or, and any agricultural value or any other economic possibility, that was a perfect place for a national park because then you could, in a sense, pull it out of the public domain that was to be developed by private enterprise. And that was one of the one of the criteria for national parks for a very long time was that that they needed to be magnificent places of no other economic value. And Roosevelt says that in a number of his statements. He, it was something I, I had in one of the slides yesterday about his understanding of Yellowstone and Yosemite and the Grand Canyon. So there, he had that understanding of how the process worked. And then he used executive orders with just unbelievable skill and boldness to create the National uh, Federal Bird Sanctuaries, being the first 51 of them. Uh, he took the Antiquities Act and not only expanded its scope, and definition and name some things that strictly speaking weren't intended by the, the, the enabling legislation. But then he used, he cleverly used the National Antiquities and Monument System as a probationary first start towards eventual national park status. I think it would be, he went so far on the National Forest, for example, that um, Charles Fulton, senator from Oregon, um, and Congress tried to stop him by placing a rider on an appropriations bill to prevent TR from naming any further um, national forests in six northwestern states, and Roosevelt reluctantly signed that legislation, but he used the interim to name another 16 million acres of national forests in those very states. And I don't think any president in American history has been more effective <coughs> in using the tools in his political tool chest to further the, the, um, the agenda of American conservation. And I think any other president who had been president between 1901 and 19 would have gotten far less accomplished in conservation than Roosevelt was able to. I don't know if anyone disagrees with that, but I think that this was, if you talk about strategic genius, he showed, if this, is, if this exemplifies his strategic genius on trusts and on domestic policy and the economy and the railroads, it's a sign of one of the great masterful presidents of, of American history. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, mean, I would just want to add, and I think it's implicit in everything you're saying. I mean, Muir was an extremist. And he may be an extremist in life, but that what he wanted to, to close off development of large swaths of the West, and no president could buy that, and that wasn't really feasible. And so I think he represented what couldn't be done by Roosevelt, and Roosevelt wasn't going to do what couldn't be done. So if, if politics is the art of the possible, he made the most of, of that. I mean, I think that debate that he had with Muir about preservation and conservation is oversimplified because I think Roosevelt was both a preservationist and a conservationist. He was strategically trying to get whatever he could, but he certainly was a utilitarian at heart, that, and he would have regarded Muir as a dangerous extremist if Muir had any power. Um, Teddy Roosevelt, I know, and Alice Lee Devore Touched on 
in, in uh, Dakota, but also could you, could you or the other panelists address uh, the financial uh, burdens of being a member of, uh, of society that uh, TR and his family were in terms of not just prior to becoming vice president, but what the looming financial burden was of serving four years as vice president mm -hmm. and the social obligations the social obligations and the, and the financial expectations of serving in Washington in high office for the Roosevelt family. Well, by, by the time TR became president, the, the family finances had evened out, shall we say, uh, right in the early 1890s. Uh, an uncle of Edith Roosevelt's died and left her a considerable amount of money, which, um, I mean, they, they'd actually been talking in terms of possibly having to give up Sagmore. Hill and live more quietly, uh, which TR did not like. But you know, between having a steady job as civil service commissioner or police commissioner and, and secretary of the Navy, the sales from his books and articles, by, by the time he was president, um, you know, their, their finances were fine. And obviously, he, he got a salary as president, and uh, Edith was happy about that too. Because it was even a higher salary than. than Colonel of the Army got. So there, there were, there's a lot of social obligation. Um, the family's finance, finances in the White House, obviously, they paid their own expenses in terms of food and clothes and things like that for their children, but they also had uh, an entertainment budget for, for running the musical events and, and the other social obligations um, in, in the White House. In terms of living, when they were living in New York and they were private citizens, the Roosevelt's actually weren't that social. They, they went to lectures and music halls and uh, dinner parties and such, but they, they don't seem to have been really interested in going to, to balls and fancy parties. TR was, was uh, in, on several occasions, very disparaging about the Newport crowd, and, and he didn't like the idea of just going uh, to be seen somewhere and to party, just to party. Um, he was interested in learning things, you know, or in meeting interesting people. And so it's obviously less expensive to have a dinner party than it is to have a ball for 400 people. And, and that's sort of where TR's and Edith's interests were. Yes? Well, I'd just like to think of share something with the group. Uh, there's a great site uh, sponsored by the University of Michigan, it's an audio um, video repository. Yes. 
negative uses of power in my Theodore Roosevelt. Wow, that's a really interesting, deep question. I don't know if I'm, I'm maybe too cold to think as deep as, <laughs> as that question wants me to go. Um, no, I really appreciate that. Thank you, that's really interesting. Um, I do think that, I think one of the interesting things about Roosevelt is that um, in some ways he was so, you know, the maverick and like with Panama Canal, he just did what he wanted to do. He had some quote, which I play, you might remember it exactly, something like, I just took Panama and then I let them debate it afterwards. Is that more or less it? Yeah. I took Panama and now the Senate can debate me for the next two years. <laughs> Um, so he definitely had that ability to, to just do what he wanted to do. And um, William Appleman Williams, the great historian of U.S. foreign policy, once said that, that Roosevelt's taking of the Panama Canal Zone was the most um, crude and, and imperialistic act of any president in U.S. history. Uh, I don't know. He's got some competition there. Uh, <laughs> so I, I'm not so sure about that, but it was it was um, a, a, a very controversial act at the time, and Roosevelt, uh, you know, played it really well by that. By as Clay had the quote, just doing it and ma making people deal with it afterwards. Um, at the same time, I think. I think one of the things that's, that makes Roosevelt interesting to me is that although at this conference we've, there, we've seen much to praise about his political strategizing and reforms he pushed for, uh, what I keep coming back to is that in many ways what's brilliant about Roosevelt is the way in which he managed to be a middle of the roader. You know, he, I mean, especially in his presidency with the Bull Moose Party, he became what people at the time would call an advanced progressive, meaning at the far end of progressivism. But in his presidency, he was, what was really brilliant about him was his ability to take the reforms that he could make work and that he could succeed at and not push too far. Um, I, I think about, a, there's a little story about William Jennings Bryan that I think can reflect something very important about Roosevelt. Um, I think some of you, maybe a lot of you know that I grew up in Nebraska, Clay mentioned that, and my grandfather in the first decade of the 20th century was a, would go to Sunday school, and his Sunday school teacher was William Jennings Bryan. And uh, my grandfather wrote in his memoirs that he, once the lesson for the day in the Sunday school class, the topic was success. And my grandfather said, I, I ventured, I was a young lad, and I, thinking of uh, Mr. Bryan having run for the presidency several times and failed, I uh, raised my hand and offered up that success didn't really matter. What mattered was how hard you tried um, and, and what your vision was. And I was roundly criticized by Bryan, who said to me that I was absolutely wrong and that the only thing that really mattered was success. And I think, I mean, I think Brian is also fascinating, but here's where Roosevelt had him beat. Roosevelt knew how to succeed, and that's why we're all here talking about Roosevelt and not about William Jennings Bryan. Well, uh, Roosevelt once called William Jennings Bryan a human trombone. <laughs> Uh, which is unfair. <laughs> but let me ask you a question. You, you gave that brilliant and exceedingly careful lecture yesterday about Roosevelt, and you didn't play your own hand very much. You really just told us what Roosevelt's race uh, career looks like. But if we're talking about abuse of power, I mean, it would seem to me that the Brownsville incident is a clear abuse of power in retrospect. That a president of the United States could have let that be devolved. He could have let somebody else handle it. He could have compromised when the facts began to come out. Uh, how do you, uh, can you give us a, a sort of a, an analysis or a reflection today about how you really see his record on race in terms of, we know that it was, it was complex and, and it was riddled with, with ambivalences, but how do you finally evaluate? 
Well, I guess I'd like to start by just discussing the issue of power. An interesting thing about Roosevelt and power and race relations is that at the beginning of his presidency, his use of power and his refusal to back down from arguments really served African Americans well when he made the appointment of Crump and there was so much opposition to it. Um, when he spoke out against lynching very bravely at a time to do so was very unpopular. When he defended Minnie Cox in Mississippi, all of which in many ways were politically losing value, um, battles for him. But the striking thing is we see also the counterpart of this, you know, the bad part of it in Brownsville, and that is when he's backed into this situation, he refuses to compromise, he refuses to step back and think carefully about himself. And I think it's striking that in that case we see both the potentials of using power, especially to help people who are outside of the political process and don't have a lot of influence, for example, in Congress, that a president can really help people in that way, and African Americans really embrace that. I guess in, in my talk, I wanted, I, I wanted to avoid taking sides and lecturing to people, but I think that my own feelings are similar to what I think many African Americans decided about Theodore Roosevelt, is that fundamentally his goal of focusing on promoting opportunity for a small number of high achievers among African Americans, fundamentally that was ultimately doomed when there's an assumption that African Americans are unequal, when there's an assumption that there's a tendency um, of disloyalty among African Americans, or there's a tendency towards criminality. And I think my emphasis on the growing up black opposition to Roosevelt I saw provided me an opportunity to point out that contradiction in Roosevelt's policy. And I think that we often think that we, that we can solve problems, especially racial problems, by dealing with individuals in a fair and open manner. And in a fair and open manner, I think in many ways that's what Roosevelt was trying to do. But at the same time, if we don't pay attention to the larger structural inequalities, if we don't pay attention to some of our stereotypes among African Americans who aren't as successful, some of the African Americans we might see on television shows, if we don't really try to understand all groups among African Americans and the challenges they face, I think it's very hard, ultimately, for us to be fair to any individuals. But I mean, you didn't say much about American Indians yesterday, but you started your talk with that devastating statement he made that, and I won't say the only good Indian is a dead Indian, but it's true nine times out of ten, and I wouldn't be too sure about the eleven. It's pretty hard to, to think of a statement more damning and extreme than that one by a major figure on this question. But then he, he boasts that in the Rough Riders there were Native Americans, that he knew this Indian and that Indian and liked them very much. It's, it's just what you're talking about, that he, could, he didn't like tribes of any sort, but that he was able to like um, this individual or that. And you're saying that even though that's, that's better than not liking them, period, that that's a very limited, problematic, way of looking at race. Oh, definitely. And, I, you know, it's interesting because, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. said at one point that he preferred facing off with a member of the Ku Klux Klan than with a Southern moderate. Um, because oftentimes giving people a half measure of something is a way of diffusing, um, diffusing anger, diffusing resentment, and one of the striking things Often, one of the striking things, if we look at Southern history, is, for example, after the race riot, there was an attempt at interracial cooperation that whites really promoted as a way of restoring Atlanta's image in the national press, and also because whites became fearful in Atlanta that African Americans were going to rebel. There was a lot of black defensive violence during the riot. Um, but what ended up happening is, this moderation turned national attention away from Atlanta, and Atlanta became famous as solving the racial problem. Throughout Atlanta's history, this interracial cooperation would continue and continue and continue, but what's striking about it is it prevented um, Atlanta in many ways 
from having the sorts of um, African -Amer American anger that we see in cities like Birmingham. And so during the 1960s and even today, Atlanta is actually one of the most segregated cities in, in throughout the entire South, especially residentially, and it has among the greatest economic inequality in the South. And what happened is African Americans who might, the African American leadership work very closely with whites and their close work with whites prevented violence over and over again. They made compromises, there were reforms in the police department, but it did it without addressing the, the larger structural problems and the black leadership became so tied in in many ways to the power structure in Atlanta that they found themselves compromising to make short-term gains rather than confronting racial injustice directly in order to create greater change in the long term. Edith, I don't have time for this. Uh, Amy, we're just about out of time. Say a few words about, you want to talk a little bit about PR and the, the dark side or abuse of power? Well, I don't know if I'd call it the dark side. Um, I, I think the problem we have, looking back at Theodore Roosevelt or, or any of the historic figures, you know, it's, it's easy to say that, oh, those other presidents, they were dull, boring, gray men. But, you, you know, Theodore Roosevelt was a real boy, as, as you say. He wasn't Pinocchio, he wasn't a marionette, and he wasn't Superman. Um, he had his good side, he had his bad side. Um, someone referred to the really, really bad treatment he gave Woodrow Wilson uh, in, in the teens, that he just hated Woodrow Wilson and just ranted against him. And, and we tend to overlook that now. Um, you know, not, I don't understand why he was so hostile towards most people that he was. You know, TR is like any of us, that, that he had got on with some people and there were some people that just rubbed him the wrong way. He had good days and he had bad days and then he did things that inspire us and then he did things that really disappoint us. And um, I think that as, as historians living a hundred years later, you know, it's, it's our responsibility to remember that he's a real person uh, and not to do him the disservice of expecting him to be um, a head on a mountain or, or a, a port, face in a portrait, that to try to, to remember that he's a real person and, and to give him all sides of his character and, and to remember his flaws as well as his uh, accomplishments. I, you know, I love what, what you said about that. I think Roosevelt's one of the hardest presidents to remember that he's an actual human being because the myth is so big and his self-myth the self-mythologizing, self-fashioning, self-dramatic uh, dramatics kind of take over the discourse and the anecdotes alone are so colorful that you kind of always forget that this is an actual politician who goes to the office and does actual things in the real world, in the arena. And I love what Julie said, that all presidents are annoying in some way. <laughs> that was an absolutely first-rate thing to say. And it, it kind of helps us get through the next weeks here. but. Uh, I, I'm going to bring Sharon up. It's time to close, unfortunately. It's, it's, it's sad for me to think that we just can't carry on. I, I just want to stop and ask you to reflect the audience on this for a minute. We're in Medora, North Dakota. Um, permanent population, 80, 80 people. It's a town of 80 people. And we have four extraordinary, nationally admired historians and scholars who have come all this way to, to see us and have given endlessly to us, and, you know, in a typical symposium, a scholar flies in, gives her talk, and is out, and doesn't want to linger with the local people and so on, because they're very busy, they, et cetera, et cetera. We are so fortunate that we're able to attract people of this capacity who come and talk in this informal way, with this sort of candor, and this generosity of spirit. And I just want you to appreciate what you've just seen here at this moment. Conversations with all of you. So thank you. It's really been splendid. Here, here. Oh, I want to second that. It's been a wonderful experience. Thank all of you. Well, now you know how to find us. <laughs>
We now know that the weather here is spectacular. We know that our hospitality is terrific. We're going to have lunch here in a minute. I want to thank Valerie Naylor for your uh, hosting us here. And we, we, a lot of us want to see the cabin. So before the day is out, the Maltese Cross Cabin is at the, that's the one physical relic of Roosevelt that we know um, exists um, in Western North Dakota. It's on the interpretive uh, site. It's just outside the, um, the headquarters of Theodore Roosevelt National Park. We'll be able to see that today for the hikes and uh, you know this great um, afternoon to come and will culminate with the reception at the North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame, which is just a few steps from here. So thanks to Perry, thanks to Julie, thanks to David, thanks to Amy, thanks to Valerie for a great morning. Thanks to you for your questions, and now Sharon, announcements.